Very welcome to the round room at the Mansion House, a very historic location for this country looking forward to its future. And today we're going to explore the opportunities of a consumer-driven energy future. My name is Matt Cooper. I am going to be the Master of Ceremonies for the day, facilitating panel discussions as well as introducing our various speakers. And we would like to thank the ESB for its sponsorship of this very timely conference. Now, just before we begin, a few housekeeping notes for you, please. Please take note of the fire exits in the venue, the door to which you entered, and the doors at the side of the stage as well, please. We would ask if you could please put your mobile phones to silent mode. Uh, although silent, because we do want you using your phone, we would encourage you to tweet about this conference using the hashtags TakeCharge2017 and Energy Future. So those are our two hashtags, hashtag TakeCharge2017 and hashtag Energy Future. And you can also find the speaker's Twitter handles on the last page of your conference programme. Now, we're also running a competition for the best conference tweet, and for a chance to win a 100 euro one-for-all voucher, please use the hashtag, hashtag TakeCharge2017 and tag at ESB Group in your tweet before half past three, and shortlisted tweets will be put to the, an audience vote this afternoon. Now, something else I'm going to ask you to use, which you'll be needing your phones for, Slido. Now, Slido, some of you who go to conferences will be familiar with it as a way to interact. Sometimes people can be a little bit shy about asking questions from the audience. This is the perfect opportunity to drive the conversation when we get to the panel discussions for you to ask the informed questions that I may not think of because I don't come from your particular industry. So the instructions are coming up on the screen there. Uh, to use Slido, please open the browser on your mobile phone, navigate to sly.do, and enter the event code Take Charge. You'll be able to post your questions to the speaker at any time during the session. Now, if you're not comfortable using Slido, although we would ask you please to do so, there will be event stewards on the floor of the hall who will take your question in written format and will submit them then to the online platform for me to see. And another function of Slido is that it allows for instant polling of you, the conference audience. And we will be having a few polls throughout the conference asking your opinion on some key issues. So we'll give it a go right now, if you don't mind, just to make sure that you are on top of how to use Slido. So if you go to sli.do or slido.com on your mobile device, enter the event code Take Charge, and on the top of your screen, navigate to polls. And just please answer the following question. Which sector uses the most energy in Ireland? Is it A, electricity, B, heat, or C, transport? So, A, B, or C. A for electricity, B for heat, or C, transport? We're expecting it to come up. There we are. And that's the answer that we have been given. I'm told that the answer actually is transport uses 35% of energy, electricity uses 32, and heat uses 33. Anyway, we'll come back to explaining Slido a little bit before our first panel questions and answer session. Now, earlier this year, ESB opened a new visitor centre at Ardna Crusha in County Clare to tell the story of the Shannon Scheme. The Shannon Scheme is part and parcel of our natural, national history and national heritage. It brought 100% renewable energy to towns across Ireland and transformed a way of living that had existed for generations. 90 years later, it is still producing renewable energy for our nation. We have a short video now for you to see from the Ardna Crusha experience as a reminder of this great feat of engineering and the role that it continues to play in Irish society.
So there we are, a landmark for this country and so important. But we're now to look to the future. And this is the first session of our conference towards a low carbon future. So I'd like to invite Pat O'Doherty, the Chief Executive of the ESB, to give us the opening remarks. Uh, th thank you, Matt. Uh, good morning, everybody. On behalf of ESB and the IIEA, I'm delighted to welcome you all here to the Mansion House for what promises to be a lively discussion on a subject that is very relevant to all of us, not just in our professional lives, but also as consumers of energy and indeed as citizens. Changing customer expectations and rapid advances in technology Population growth and, above all, the threat posed by climate change are bringing about fundamental changes in the way the energy landscape across, in the energy landscape across the globe and the way in which energy is kind of is generated, distributed, and consumed. At COP21 in Paris almost two years ago, the UN agreed the first comprehensive agreement on action against climate change, which committed the nations of the world to restricting global temperature increase to between one and a half and two degrees. In Europe, targets have been set for 2020, 2030, and 2050, which aim to progressively cut carbon emissions by between 85 and 90 percent compared to no levels in 1990. Here in Ireland, the government's white paper, uh, Ireland's transition to a low carbon energy future 2015 to 2030, sets out the goals and targets for Ireland in this context. The message in the direction of travel is clear we are moving to a more sustainable future and there is no turning back. Along with agriculture, energy is a major contributor to Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions. Together, transport, heating and electricity generation account for over 50% of carbon emissions. How these sectors develop over the next decade will be a key determinant in Ireland's ability to meet its targets. Whether it's the fuel we use to heat our homes or fill up our cars, or the electricity we use in keeping our lights on, transformative change is needed. Over the course of today, you will hear about how organisations, including ESB, are preparing for this change, and in particular, the role that electricity will play. ESB was founded 90 years ago this year, and since then, electricity has become an essential part of all our lives, evolving over time from very basic appliances for lighting and cooking, to powering everything from incubators in hospitals to smart TVs and mobile devices. But although the application for electricity have changed, the basic principles underpinning generation and supply have remained largely constant. Electricity has been produced in large centrally dispatched generating stations and distributed to largely passive customers over radial electricity networks. Customers traditionally have had very little interaction with the electricity system, except to turn on and off the switch when they needed power. Other than basic night and day rates, they weren't incentivized to use less power at times when it was most expensive, or indeed to use more when electricity was cheapest. They couldn't produce their own electricity, and they don't have a whole lot of control over their usage. All of this is changing, and it, and it and as it does, the consumer is coming front and centre of the emerging energy landscape. By 2050, the population of Ireland is expected to grow by about 30%, resulting in about a half a million more homes being built and potentially a million more cars on our roads. This will massively increase our carbon output unless we completely transform the way we produce and consume energy. Over the past 15 years, the electricity sector in Europe has made great strides in laying the groundwork for more sustainable energy future. Much of the visible evidence of this is in electricity generation where wind farms, solar panels, and other renewable technologies are significantly re reducing carbon intensity of electricity. Since 1990, the carbon intensity of electricity gener generated in Ireland has halved. Less evident, but equally important, has been the changes that have taken place on the electricity network to make this possible. Over the past decade, ESB Networks has invested over 7 billion euro to make the electricity network smarter and more resilient. 
and to connect large amounts of renewable, primarily wind generation. The third wave of innovation in electricity is downstream, where customers interact with the electricity system. New microgeneration technologies like solar PV are freely available, making it possible for customers to generate for themselves or sell power back to the grid. The Internet of Things is connecting everything from energy assets to sensors in the home, and digitally connected customers are able to manage their energy and, and how they use that energy remotely through smart controls like Nest and like Climote. New business models are emerging that harness the collective power of customers to provide balancing services to the grid, both centrally and locally. Battery storage and electric vehicles are opening up potential for large-scale storage of electricity. The possibilities appear endless. ESB's ambition, which I will talk about later on this afternoon, is for electricity to be a catalyst for change across the whole energy sector, powering not only the appliances and industries that have traditionally relied on electricity, but also sectors that are still dependent on carbon-intensive fossil fuels, such as transport and heating. Engaged, connected customers are at the heart of this ambition. The willingness of ordinary people to, to adapt their lifestyles, adopt new technologies, and engage as active participants in a new an energy landscape is absolutely critical if we're to meet carbon reduction targets. For this to happen, their needs must be put front and centre of all new developments. What looks like the obvious technical choice isn't always the one that customers will sign up to. All customers are different. What is rational and exciting for one can be alienating and frightening for another. People's belief systems, their values and their knowledge, their fears and their trust in our industry will all feed into their reaction to new products and technologies and will ultimately determine their success. Today's conference, and it's interesting to look around the wall here and the questions that are phrased, and maybe people haven't seen them, but I'll just read them out here. What is Ireland's path to a low-carbon future? What do energy consumers really want? How will e-mobility transport us to a low-carbon future? How can the power of data help us save energy and money? And how can we put the levers for change in energy consumers' hands? These are key questions that are going to be exposed and debated here today. And the conference is going to examine all of these themes and will hopefully shed light on strategies and approaches that can help us to ensure that as we move towards a low-carbon future, consumers become fully engaged in the journey. I would like to thank very much uh, our partners in this conference, the IIEA, for pulling together what is undoubtedly an outstanding lineup of speakers. I look forward to hearing about some of the practical ways that organizations are already connecting with customers and communities. And I hope that the insights from today's event will help us to collectively transition to a brighter, cleaner energy future with the customers right at its center. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. So let's start with our opening speakers. And the award of this year's Nobel Prize for Economics to a behavioral economist shows the critical importance of behavioral psychology for modern business strategies. Our next speaker, Oliver Payne, is the author of the book Inspiring Sustainable Behavior, 19 Ways to Ask for Change. He's also the founder and managing director of the Hunting Dynasty, a London-based behavioral insight and communications agency which has worked with government, NGOs, and energy companies such as British Gas. He's going to talk to us about inspiring sustainable behavior. So would you please welcome Oliver Payne. Thank you very much, Matt. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as previously advertised, I am Oliver Payne from the Hunting Dynasty. Everybody asks us why we have this name. It's because we're looking for things that last for generations to come. Let me move on. How do I move on? How do I move the slides up? How do I move the slides on? There's a big green button with an arrow on it. Need to re rework this interface. So uh, two things I'm going to do for you, first of all. First thing is to move straight to the content slide so we can see the shape of the talk this morning. 
I'm going to have a little bit about me, just briefly how I got here, and not walking from the, walking from the hotel, obviously. Um, we're going to do a little trot through decision making. It's the barest of bare bones. So if there's any psychologists in the room, don't worry about it. By the end of it, you'll know it. Um, we're going to do a little stroop test as well, which is reading some words off the screen. So I know I'm, I'm as European as you are, tremendously embarrassing doing that kind of thing, particularly in the morning. But the doors are locked, and we'll never speak of it again. After that, I'll do all the heavy lifting, and we'll go through norms, have a look at some normative effects. We'll look at construal, habit, uh, and framing, and some lovely examples about consumer behavior changed on there. It's a little bit about me, very quickly. I spent a, I spent a little bit of my uh, time in digital startups a long time ago. And then 10 years in advertising on all sorts of uh, businesses, including mostly actually on, uh, at the end of it on BP, doing a lot of uh, global digital work. Um, and around about 2007, so around about 10 years ago, started to look at uh, how behavior worked. And it's by sustainable behavior. I run the London Behavioral Economics Network, which is 3,000 people in London. And we have affiliates all over the world uh, and a variety of clients that we work for, uh, particularly around uh, the kind of 2007 mark, I started to have a bit of a think about what really, really drives our behavior. Having spent 10 years in advertising, no one really cared as long as the, the work was good and won lots of awards. And that led to uh, a book around weaving psychology and behavior and environmental behavior and environmental psychology particularly together. So I pulled out some examples from the work that I researched around energy consumption. And there's lots of other things in there as well. So decision making, the barest of bare bones. Okay. It's true that we're not always in control of our decisions as we think we are. And it's part of the weft and the warp of our language that we, kind of, we have the head and the heart. You know, oh, my, my gut says this, and my head says one thing, and my heart says another. But interestingly, even though we can process a sort of 11 million pieces of information a second, 10 million of those through the eyes, the, uh, the proportion is a little bit asymmetric. In terms of our conscious deliberative thought, we can only really deal with 40 pieces of sensory information per second. And so that would be like if I turned the light on on and off very quickly, or after about 40 times a second, you would, uh, you'd not see any difference between those two things. And if you, uh, if you drive, imagine when you were learning how to drive a car, you couldn't have a conversation with someone else when you're learning to drive. When you can drive, it becomes automatic, and you can have a conversation with someone. They're the two different memory systems that are working. And we'll give you an example of that. So we can say that we're kind of outnumbered by automatic responses. Our automatic responses are, uh, are much larger than our, our deliberative thinking. And not only that, our deliberative thinking uh, is draining. It runs out. You know the kind of thing of like 45 minutes and you get tired. After an hour, you get tired of, of working on a task. This is very true. So we can say that we're outnumbered and outperformed by our non-conscious response. And we're going to echo all of that through the rest of the talk this morning. Even if you try and sort of uh, avoid it, you can't. There's a very lovely example from a parole board in Israel. So a parole board will be judges looking at bad men, usually men, bad men in prison, seeing if, they can, seeing if they're ready to, to leave prison. And you can see there on the graph, they, the judges made fewer and fewer favorable decisions as time elapsed from their previous break time. So their non-conscious response was stay in prison, deliberatively trying to overwhelm it and becoming less and less effective as that as time went by. So you're going to do that now as well. I'm going to show you that. We're going to do the Stroop test. The Stroop test is very simple. All we have to do, all of us, I'll do it with you as well, all we have to do is say the color of the word that's on the screen. So we wouldn't say the Stroop test. We'd say blue, green, and red. That's it. There's two parts to it. Six words first, 12 words second. OK? I won't ask you to do anything else after this, is it? Right. Promise. It's not one of those yay talks. You won't have to make friends with the person next to you or anything like that. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. So it's very simple. I'll do it with you. Six words. Okay. Say the color of the word. Do not read the word. Ready? Blue. Green. You're all geniuses. That was amazing. <laughs> We're going to do it again. Twelve words this time. I don't know what the words are. Well, I do. But you don't know what the words are. Do not read the word. Please do not read the word. Say the color of the word. That's it. You ready? <laughs> I 
Of course, of course, of course. And I, I went a little bit quick. It gets quite tricky, right? And, and what's happening there is that on purpose, obviously, we've pipetted the color of the word different to, the, to the, the, the description. And you can feel yourself effortfully trying to override your instinct to read the word first, and then oh, stop and try to say the color. And if you remember back the, the, the iceberg, that's exactly what's happening. Your non-conscious response, your automatic response is to read the word, and you're trying to overwhelm yourself to do that. Okay? And this happens in these formats where I've, I've, I've explicitly made that the case. This happens throughout our life. All of our decisions have this, uh, this pairing going on. Okay? So it's fair to say, picture of me in the morning, haha, that we are ancient creatures in modern times. We actually have these really good systems. This is a very good way of functioning, um, uh, 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 alleviating the burden of most of our thinking to automatic responses. This is a very good way of living in a, a short and brutal lives 100,000 years ago. Not so good today. OK, so that's it. Sit back, relax. I'll do the heavy lifting from here on in. Okay. We're going to talk about norms. Norms is interesting. Norms tells us that we have a shared understanding about expectations of behavior within a group. We tend to borrow decisions from the group. Let's show you some examples of that. So wouldn't it be true that the geographic clustering of solar panels, we're going to go to California, the geographic clustering of solar panels should be high in green neighborhoods. Green neighborhoods, lots of Prius Democratic voters in, in America and low in non-green neighborhoods. That would be a fair assumption, okay? Those attitudes should reflect the uh, instance of solar panels. However, Bollinger and Gillingham in, between 2001 and 2006 found that the geographic clustering of solar panels in California appears at a neighborhood level and does not simply match the density or greenness of the zip code. Why is that? Well, norms decoupled action of insulation from attitude because of the visibility of the panels. It was an, it was a, a, an evident and prevalent behavior that was performed. And also word of mouth of builders. They found that every 1% increase in solar panels in the neighborhood was a 1% decrease in the time to the next installation. So it's a curvilinear relationship. The more that was there, the more that became there. Evidencing the prevalence of behavior informs ourselves about what we should do in terms of our, in terms of our behavior. So how do we synthetically create that? We can do. We'll go to, uh, we'll stay on the west coast and we'll go to San Marcos. This is a lovely experiment with the origins of O-Power. They did a sample of 12,000 households and they put some different uh, door hangers on the doors. Uh, some different information, some financial information, information about social responsibility, obviously an environmental condition as well. You should save your air conditioning because it will make sense for the environment. And some combined versions as well. And they went through... Uh, uh, all those households for four weeks. They did some door-to-door -door interviews and they had some meter reading. So let's see what they said and what they, how they behaved. The descriptive norm is the one I want us to focus on. The descriptive norm is a, very, uh, a real picture of the experiment. Look at this line here. How are most San Marcos residents conserving this summer by using fans instead of AC? So that's a, a descriptive norm. How are most people doing it? They're doing it this way. Most people thought that a social responsibility message would be the most effective at changing behavior. Also, that an environmental message would be the most effective at changing behavior. Nobody thought, when asked, these were the people that were being experimented on, by the way, nobody thought that a descriptive norm, don't tell me what other people are doing, that's not going to change my behavior, thought that would be very ineffective indeed. Of course, when we look at the average daily energy consumption during that intervention, the descriptive norm is the lowest by far, somewhere between 12.6 and 12.8 kilowatt hours, almost a kilowatt hour per day lower than all the other interventions. Simply, the only one to talk to the non-conscious response was the, uh, the San Marcos, what other people are doing thing. So we can say that you know, talking to our non-conscious responses is valuable. Uh, we can know that we self-report incorrectly. We see this a lot as well. The, uh, the, uh, our expectations of behavior do not match our own behavior. Um, and we do see a real decoupling between what we think affects our behavior and what actually affects our behavior. Okay. The origins of O-Power, we're all familiar with O-Power and how they've used this on their energy consumption uh, um, uh, reports. So norms is interesting. Shared understanding about expectations of behavior. Let's have a look at construal. A little bit more tricky, this one. It's quite egocentric. Where you think about something relative to yourself affects what you think about it. And that's not just in distance. There's a lot of different things in there. We'll have a look at psychological distance. The first example of this, I think, is very good. It's true that sustainable actions seem more feasible when you visualize them rather than verbalize them. 
It's also true that sustainable actions estimate to happen sooner if explained in how rather than why terms. Effectively, you end up with visualize how, you're much likely to act sooner on this rather than verbalize why. Most of the time, we verbalize why. So have a look at this example from Sarah Powell. Uh, they split two households. They had uh, uh, people that were looking to do renovations on their home, um, and they gave them some extra money and information about how to make their home more energy efficient. Months later, very little action was taken. Of course, you're giving them money and information. What else would you want? Money is a good, uh, is a good uh, bribe to change behavior. They thought that would be the case. They went back and split them into two groups. Uh, one group were given simply, really, a heat loss image of their home at night, actually of their home. It's much more proximal, much more concrete, much more here now. Given the same information as text, so for instance, on the, on the infrared image, you can see the, the windows are, uh, are nice and bright, so that would be telling you that that's where a lot of heat was being lost. In the printed form, it would say that you know, there was one kilowatt hour of energy was being lost through your window. When they did this, they went back and had a look. If the householder saw the thermal image they were eight times more likely to have installed draft proofing than if they'd not seen the image at all. But not only that, five times more likely to have improved glazing and leaky doors and more diligent behavior such as closing windows and careful use of curtains. As Sarah Darby says, thermal imaging seems to make energy more tangible. It rematerializes energies when we talk about proximal constructions, where you think about, where you think about things relative to yourself affects your behavior. They thought about it much more proximal, concrete. They could see it, if you like. Sarah Paul says, psychological distance seems to have a great potential for sustainability-related perceptions. Let's have a look. Uh, California Edison did a similar thing. They were texting people and uh, emailing people around uh, when uh, uh, electricity was expensive and when it was cheap in order to try and change their behavior. It didn't make any difference at all. When they tried it with an orb, simply an orb that either glowed green or uh, red, when, red when price was at its peak, uh, People reduce their energy consumption by 40% during peak times. A very simple way, very non-specific way, actually, but a very simple way of rematerializing when it was expensive or when it was cheap. And let's jump into the shower. Uh, also using utilities at the point of use. Uh, water use studied with labels. There's a label here in the shower. This label is it's not particularly excitingly designed, but it has a lot of information around uh, your rematerializing your use of the uh, uh, water consumption. Um, and those labels, you can see on the bottom line there, they reduced water consumption consistently and considerably over no label condition. So simply rematerializing the use of the utility at the point of use is a really good way of, uh, of asking us to reappraise what we're doing and how we're using it. Okay? Now, slightly more uh, uh, ethereal, but interesting nonetheless. If you have a look at, on the left, on the left food, and on the right, uh, an energy bill, Think about this. Much, most, uh, uh, many of us have energy consumption presented in raw numbers, like on the, on the right-hand side. Consider if you went to the supermarket and groceries in a hypothetical store without price markings at all, and you were billed monthly with a kind of $527 for you know, 2,000 food units. How would you economize under such conditions? Well, of course, you know, that's not how we purchase food. It's always priced at the point of use. There's other ways of doing this as well, which you could actually, uh, you could actually uh, uh, sell units of energy at the point of use. And of course, smart meters do that too. So we end up in a position where we're now rematerializing energy at the point of use. It's a very good way of doing it. And then finally, uh, uh, a little bit more ethereal again, but rematerializing and naming uh, the uh, elements that we use is a very interesting point. Uh, Institute for Fiscal Studies found that labeling winter fuel payment as cash, that was it? They found that three, pen was, three pounds was spent on fuel. So 97 pounds of it was spent elsewhere. When they labeled it specifically as winter fuel payment, simply that, 41 pounds was spent on fuel. So actually the, 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 the naming that you give it gives you a proximal construction and gives you an idea about how it should be used, rematerializes it. So that's construal, where you think about something relative to yourself affects your definition of it and your behavior. Habit is an interesting one. Habit ascribes the simplest and most repetitive tasks uh, to habit to relieve us from the burden of thinking about every decision from scratch. It's a very good evolutionary tactic. And habit isn't, isn't, um, isn't that uh, I, I get the 
I get the, I go and get the papers every Saturday. That's just a routine. Habit is something that's completely unthinking. So whenever I leave the house, I always check my keys because the first house I bought, I locked myself out within the first five minutes. It was very embarrassing. So I've al I always said every time I leave a door, I always, always check those things. We'll have all of those habitual behaviors in us. Having a look at water consumption, so utility consumption in Australia, which is a very hot topic, uh, they found there was association between positive attitude towards water conservation and actual water conservation was weak. It was very weak, actually. What happened was that things such as habitually running a tap while brushing teeth, maybe part of a long-term behavior settled on when conservation was not an issue, maybe 10, 15, even 20 years ago. And of course, when, when you're older and attitudes have changed, that deep-seated behavior hasn't changed at all. As Department of Environment and Rural F uh, Affairs say, attitudes may wander, but everyday behaviors are likely to reflect long-standing routines and so explain the apparent gap between attitudes and actions. The, action, the attitude and action gap is a really significant thing to consider and it's the work we have to do the most with most of our uh, uh, clients and consumers. How do you deal with that? Well, disrupting habitual behavior is kind of the key to deal with those things. Uh, Tim Cotter says, fix conditions, hold habits in place. So if you change those conditions, you can change the habit. Moving home is a good way of stopping people, uh, of, of, of having people change, for instance, their energy supply. Getting to them before they've moved is quite difficult. Of course, most people move home, accept the default that's there, and then it's very difficult to move them off again. So this is a real key moment where we can change that behavior. Um, Skip one. And then, so that was habit. Let's have a look at framing. So framing is around situational influences. Um, this one is the really tricky one that we don't like to kind of accept as, as, as individual humans, but decision making is relative to what you can have, not absolutely about what you want. Uh, uh, free will is actually a, a condition of the choice which is presented in front of us. I'll give you a lovely example here from Carl's. Huber and Puto car choice experiment was great. Um, they gave people uh, a choice of these three cars. You can see there's different, different kind of dimensions there. Ride quality, acceleration, and mileage are all, all kind of different, and quite complex dimensions as well. When asked which would you want in terms of ride quality and safety, most people chose this, you know, middle, that was the middle option, the kind of uh, ride quality 50 acceleration is kind of okay. They'll have that. Mostly about minimization of regret. If you choose one of the extreme uh, uh, choices, and you could be two choices away from the best. If you choose the middle, it's generally okay. Most people choose that. Those people were removed. Uh, the same people were, uh, a similar group were introduced with a new, uh, uh, even better ride quality car in the set. Because remember what the middle choice was. And then they asked, which one would you like in terms of ride quality and safety? Most people chose a slightly higher version, which was the extreme in the previous set. Okay. Uber and Puto, we see a kind of 10% increase in preference for a target every time we do this. And if we do this in terms of, try it again with miles per gallon, which one would you like? This one, introduce a new lower miles per gallon car, which would you like? This is the new middle option. This is the one that I want. So actually, this tells us however many or few outliers will be sold or however many uh, uh, options you've got on the outside, uh, the... The, the range of options that you present will affect the choice of all of the other options in that option set. So even introducing a, uh, a newer or more environmental option for people will drag consideration towards it even if you don't see sales in that particular area. So that was a little bit about me, a little bit about decision making, and sorry about that, made you say things out loud in the morning, very bad of me. We had a look through norms, construal, habit, and frame it. Of course, there's many more things to look at, but these are the things I wanted to show you today. Just to round up, it is a different era right now from a behavioral point of view. We've gone from industrialization in 1850 all the way through now to product services and behavior, as Tim Stout says from the National Grid, a uh, uh, power station manufacturing company. Most of the company's efforts have been tied to infrastructure and hardware on their power generation. Changing consumer behavior is the next wave of savings to be tapped. And if there's one thing I'm gonna leave you with is this last slide. It's the only thing to remember. Well, try and remember all of it, but the only thing to remember is just as no building lacks an architecture, no choice lacks a context. Thank you very much. Ooh, 20 minutes as well, perfect. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Oliver. And Oliver will be participating in our questions and answer session at the end of this session. But our next speaker now, we're going to turn to smart grid technologies that are changing the energy sector by opening up new ways for consumers to interact with the electric system. So we're delighted to welcome Marguerite Sayers, Managing Director of ESB Networks, to discuss the smart energy technologies that ESB Networks is adapting to meet this challenge. So to talk about smart networks for smart consumers, please welcome Marguerite Sayers. Good morning, everyone. As Matt said, I'm the Managing Director of ESP Networks, and I suppose we're a bit of a Ron Seal company. We do what it says on the tin. Uh, so our job is to manage the, uh, primarily, I suppose, the distribution network in the Republic of Ireland, but also we carry out maintenance and construction on the transmission network as well. Uh, can I also just say we have a, a sister company, NIE Networks, in Northern Ireland uh, that's also part of ESB Group. And I'd say we've got very, very similar issues. Uh, but, but just in, in general terms, the figures I'll be using today will just be for the, for the Republic, just so that people know. Uh, so I suppose, um, you know, what are those issues that we're grappling with at the moment? What's taking our time? What are we thinking about? And very much we're looking to project forwards and try to anticipate what our customers are going to need, what they're going to want. Uh, by 2030, and it sounds kind of futuristic, but when you think about it, there's not an awful lot with a decade's time. So you might think actually it's reasonably easy to do, but if you look back 13 years and you see the changes that we've had, I suppose the one thing we can be sure of is we can't anticipate everything. There's going to be services and there's going to be technologies that emerge that we just can't anticipate, we can't conceive of right now, because if you go back 13 years, there weren't really certainly a widespread use of smartphones or apps or anything like that, and you can see how the world has changed. But what we can do, I suppose, is work with trends, and what we can see, first of all, from a customer perspective, is what they want is increasing levels of choice. So customers are going to want to have more control over how their energy is generated, how they use it, how they pay for it, and what they pay for it. So I suppose from that point of view, one of our jobs, because we are see, see ourselves in networks very much as the glue in the middle, our job really is to be the transport system to connect customers to the uh, energy that's generated in a lot of cases, or to offload it in other cases. So smart metering is going to be a key enabler to that, and I'll come back a little later on to our smart metering project. Second one, and I suppose uh, this is really important for our customers, but equally it's very important for us as a society, and that's the whole idea of decarbonisation. And after yesterday's uh, weather, and particularly earlier in the year here in Ireland, I don't think we need to be reminded about the extremes of weather that we see, uh, and we need to do something as an energy industry around that. But particularly, I think, in networks, we feel we've got a broader role with enhancing maybe the uh, level of use of both uh, EVs, e-transport, and also e-heating, and that's something that we're really, really keen to do. And I suppose primarily our job, first of all, is to not get in the way of any of those things, and that's a bigger challenge than you might think. And the reason is, I suppose, in ESB, we're celebrating our 90th year this year, and a huge amount of the network in the country, and we have a lot of it, was built through the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. And it wasn't built with any of the current uses that we have in mind, and it certainly wasn't built with things like EVs and e-heat uh, e in mind. Um, that was just something, I suppose, again, that wasn't conceived at the time to any large scale. So we've got a real job in our hands now to make sure that the network that was built then is capable of delivering all of those new services and also uh, capable of dealing with local generation if that's what people want and what companies want and what house householders want. Now, like I said, we've been at this for 90 years, so you said surely you must be able to figure it out, but the real challenge here is to do it and to maintain reliability, to make sure that the lights stay on, that we keep our current, or indeed enhance our current levels of reliability. And the reason that that's a challenge is that uh, most industries, and particularly ours, were very much built on predictability. So largely we knew based on what happened yesterday what was going to happen today. And between seasons you'd see fairly significant changes, but not from day to day. So the patterns were fairly fixed. And that meant that we could, you know, figure out what it was we needed to do on the network. And we really adopted a kind of fit and forget approach. So you pick the worst possible condition you could anticipate or plan for on the network. You built your network to deal with that, and then you could forget about the rest of the conditions. But what we need in future is to be far more dynamic, to be able to deal with load flows that we haven't seen in the past. Because now we've got generation in feed points at all sorts of uh, points in the network, not what we traditionally had, which was a small number of big generators. And the big generators fed into the network at high voltage, 
uh, or we transport it from high voltage down through voltage levels until you got to quite small conductors which were tapered down through the system going into ho homes and businesses. And now we've got those generation points everywhere, so the load flows are changing dramatically. I suppose one of the key things for us as a networks business is we have something called protection out there and we have protection devices and the, the idea with the protection devices is that yes, they protect the plant, but more importantly, they protect life. So they are constantly scanning the network and they're looking at, for unusual currents and unusual voltages and we program them up front to know what an unusual current or an unusual voltage is. And if it sees those in microseconds, it will, it will trip, it will take some action in order to uh, keep people safe, particularly keep people safe or to keep plants safe. And it's more and more difficult now to actually program those devices to tell them what normal is. So that whole area of changing protection, that's a big challenge for us. So having all these new services, having them on network that was built a long time ago, and also maintaining reliability, that's a key challenge. And the final one is affordability. I mean, again, if you throw an awful lot of money at something, you can achieve an awful lot, but there's a balance between what customers want and what they'll be prepared to pay for it. So we've got to move away, I suppose, from some of the traditional solutions we had, which were very hardwired solutions, and move towards some soft solutions, which is trying to find ways using technology and particularly insights uh, into our network so that we dynamically plan and dynamically uh, react and we are not in fit and forget mode anymore. So I suppose to talk about the smart grid then and what is that, um, what I'm showing there first of all is, is quite a typical uh, traditional uh, approach to the grid. So effectively you had large generating stations feeding into the network and then you had customers connected at the other end at lower voltages. And it was a, a fairly simple stable system I suppose at, at one level with very predictable unidirectional uh, current flows. In the last number of years we've had control centers then using remote technology to get, uh, I suppose, better reliability and to get visibility of the network, and, and they've been with us. But now things have changed a lot, so we have an awful lot more embedded generation, so generation feeding into the network, but what we're seeing increasing now with customers is that they want to engage, particularly businesses, but it will get to domestic customers as well, they want to engage directly with renewable generators and maybe do a, uh, some sort of transaction digitally with them and um, maybe use the transport system that we provide, but not use the traditional methods of generating. And we're seeing more and more and more of that. So just to give you some idea of scale, at the moment we've got 3,200 megawatts of renewables connected, sorry, of wind connected to the Irish system. In total, by the end of this year, there'll be 4,000 megawatts of renewables on the system of one sort or another. And the system peak is about 5,000 megawatts. So we have a very, very significant penetration of renewables. And about 50% of that is connected into the distribution system, which isn't, uh, I suppose, what we've traditionally had. We mentioned earlier there's lots of changes happening as well. We've got battery storage, and again, in future, homeowners are, are likely to totally change their patterns depending on their usage of batteries. They'll be able to store electricity, and indeed, they'll be able to trade back with uh, other companies and aggregators and possibly even other households in future using their own battery storage and maybe energy they've generated themselves. At the same time, they're obviously going to want comfort in their own homes, so we're back the, to the idea of needing to deal with e-heat and e-transport uh, type loads, but also to provide, probably not so much in Ireland, but um, air conditioning load as well. So comfort within homes is important. I mentioned this concept of householders maybe trading with each other, avoiding all of the traditional energy players, just dealing with each other. Again, we think as the transport system in the middle that we've got a role to play there, but our job is to enable that with whatever kind of dig digital transactions or currencies might happen, and I've mentioned e-transport. So what we really need is much greater visibility of the network, and that is going to require an awful lot more uh, internet of things and communication systems in order to help us to do that. Now, the other thing that we need to bear in mind, and Pat alluded to this earlier on, is that we can't forget who our customers are either, because not everybody will want to play in this very sophisticated, quite tiring when you think about it, new uh, Vista with all of this stuff going on in the energy market. Some people will want to maintain a system very much like what we have at the moment. They get a bill, they pay it, and they don't want to think any more about it. They don't want the complexity of all this trading and dealing. And I suppose looking at the census, and it's, um, I suppose, difficult to stay away from generalizing here, but just to give you a sense, based on the last census, uh, one in uh, four of our population in 2030 will be over 65. Now, they might be extremely interested and have time on their hands, uh, and have the disposable income to play in that market, or they may not. And certainly, I think we can anticipate that a portion of them won't want to do that. So I suppose all we're really saying is we can't leave, uh, all of our customers won't want to do that, and we can't leave anybody behind. 
The other thing is only about two in five are going to be the decision makers within any household. So we've got three in five are dependents, so we'll be really dealing with, I suppose, the people that are the decision makers within householders and, and households within businesses. The other demographic that's changing is the volume of people who are renting versus owning, and that can change um, how you uh, interact with energy. You may not have the wherewithal or the permission, for example, to put solar panels on your roof if you don't own the property, so that's something to bear in mind. Another one is there's very different things that we can do in urban locations and rural locations. They're just different topographies. The distances are different. The network is different. Whether somebody lives in a house or an apartment makes a difference. Whether you've got the geography, we're on to a different description, the physical space, to install a battery or to install solar PV or a small wind turbine. And certainly people's uh, disposable income and the link between that disposable income and the demographic is important. So in summary, I suppose what we're looking at for future electricity networks is that we need to at the very least maintain our current reliability despite all of the new services, but really to increase capacity so that we can deal with um, and encourage indeed e-heat and heat transport where there's huge amounts of emissions and where we can have a big impact on climate change. To do that, we're going to need real-time asset visibility. We need to know dynamically what's going on in the system and react to it and put systems in place in order to do that. And we also want to maximize and make available consumer flexibility. So again, the consumers, in so much as they want to, can play in the energy market. So I suppose the question is within ESB networks then, what are we doing about that? And uh, we have developed eight different roadmaps looking at those key areas, things that we have to uh, work on. And I suppose those eight roadmaps are a summary of 57 individual projects that we have that we're working on to try and, I suppose, get the best future flexibility for customers without actually spending a fortune on it, though it is going to cost some money, obviously. So the kind of projects that we have there are customer engagement, making sure customers can engage with each other and with us. Network resilience, which I've mentioned already, is extremely important, as is the electrification of heat and transport. The flexibility on our networks, not using them in the traditional manner, not having fit and forget being much more dynamic, but also enabling customers to, be, uh, to use flexibility as well and to trade back with the grid. Connecting renewables, extremely important for us, and like I said, we've made great inroads as a country in that area, and then operational excellence, how we operate the system. Final one is, or the final two, or first of all, we've got a huge amount of assets out there, so we need to optimize those assets, and also then how we interact with the TSO, which is air grid, is also extremely important because the boundaries aren't the same as they were in the past, they're getting a little bit more fuzzy. So you'll be glad to hear I'm not going to go through 57 projects, but I'm just going to give you a little bit of a sense of some of the trials and projects that we are doing. So the first one is if we are to uh, enable large amounts of um, e, uh, heat and also uh, electric vehicles connecting to the system, then what we need to do is to make sure the system can take that. And they are much heavier in terms of demand than in the past. The other thing we make a lot of use of in distribution planning is a thing called diversity, which is that not everybody uses the same things at the same time. They don't all go for a shower at the same time. They don't all uh, put on the washing machine or the cooker at the same time. Now, obviously, there's, there's peaks at certain times of the day, but EVs are a particular uh, challenge because if they're all plug plugged in at the same time, then that does put a real strain on the network. And that's something we have to be conscious of. Uh, and with that in mind, I suppose you'd expect us to be uh, I suppose, pr producing new standards, which we have done for uh, particularly urban uh, housing estates, so that from the middle of next year onwards, uh, with the permission and um, uh, I suppose the, for, from our regulator, what we'll be intending to do is to have a new standard for building and housing schemes, so they will be able to cope with the significant penetration of both e-heat, uh, things like air source heat pumps particularly, and also uh, EVs. I suppose the real challenge for us is, and we heard it earlier on, when, when one person in a location gets an EV or a heat, then other people tend to do the same at clusters, and that's really what the challenge is for us. So we're going to have that. We've done uh, the research on that, so we know what we need to do. And the real key um, with that is to make sure that, um, I suppose, that the costs up front when you're particularly building housing estates is uh, very much in the civil works. So it's actually quite a small marginal cost to make sure up front that you've got enough capability in the network for e-heat and heat transport. So that's what we're planning to do. But then the question is, what do you do with all of the expanse of traditional network that we've got? And this one, I suppose, gives us a much bigger challenge. Uh, so there's a number of things we're looking at. For many years now, we've had a project that we've been quietly doing in the background, which is to convert our medium voltage network from 10,000 uh, volts to 20,000 volts. 
And what that meant is we could deliver twice the amount of power on the same network. And it also meant that we significantly reduced electrical losses down to a quarter of what they would have been, which was really significant in terms of, uh, again, as, a, as an environmental project. So we're looking at the low voltage that we have now and trying to do something similar. So low voltage at three phases, 400 volts. And we're looking at the potential of operating that at 1,000 volts, which does mean putting in additional what are called sidewalk transformers. But it is a trial that we will be doing because it will mean to a large extent we can exploit our existing network and still meet a significant demand uh, of uh, e-heat and e-transport penetration. The next one then, I, I suppose, is on our low voltage network again. And most of the action before has been on higher voltages. So now we're very much looking at low voltage. So we need this real time monitoring so we can react to it. There's something called an LV smart fuse, which again has intelligence built into it, scans the network and can react to it. We need to broadcast, and what we mean by that is we need to let devices know, like cars and like heating, what's the optimum time to come in. So we could get to a situation where when there's capacity on the network, it can talk to your water heater and tell your water heater that now's a really good time to switch on or otherwise. Uh, so you can see that there is big scope here in terms of uh, future enabling of uh, customer choice and customer interaction. So like I said, interacting with the, the devices in homes. One uh, trial that we have on the go at the moment in the renewable space is um, in Cavan, and it's with a number of wind farms. And I suppose, again, to give you an idea, and I'm simplifying this now, I'm ignoring voltage. But from the point of view of capacity, the way we decide how much capacity, how much capacity there is in network to offload a wind farm, for example, is to look at what the local load is and look at the capacity of the line, and that's the maximum you can have. So to give you an example, if a line has got 20 MVA of capacity, and there's about, in summer, 3 MVA of load, then the maximum that you can take out is 23. So the 3 that's used locally plus the 20 on the network. Uh, but that's really only the worst case scenario on summer. And most of the year, maybe that load is up closer to 7 or 8 MVA. So that would mean we could offload 27 or 28 MVA rather than the 23. So it's back to, I suppose, getting away from this fit and forget, forget idea again. And what we're looking at doing there is dynamically changing the output from the wind farms depending on system conditions. So at the moment, it's being done manually. So we have our control room operators that are monitoring that and actually having a, a phone call with wind farms telling them what they can export. We're doing a second phase by the end of this year. It'll actually be just the beginning of next year where that will be done automatically over uh, technology to a large extent. Um, now, the monitoring will still happen locally, but the, the communication with the wind farm will happen remotely. And the third phase then is it's entirely automatic. Now, it sounds simple, but again, going back to my idea of abnormal currents and voltages, there's an awful lot of logic that has to be programmed in, and it's very complex to take account of all of the conditions that you might see on the network and to allow certain things to happen, but still to keep plant and, more importantly, uh, people safe. So we're also using, as you'd expect, I suppose, drones and something called LIDAR, which is uh, light detection and uh, ranging um, equipment in order to look at things like our transmission system. So we can get a really good look at the physical condition of a transmission line or a 30 AKV line without switching it out. Uh, LIDAR is this idea of kind of uh, graphing what we've got out there in terms of network. And one of the key ones here, the first one, uh, the red that you see there is our network, and the green is vegetation. And vegetation management is huge for us. So just going back to Storm Ophelia there fairly recently, our network itself stood up really well. Uh, our big challenge is actually branches and trees, and that's what we have to be conscious of all the time. So we spend a lot of our time in vegetation management, and this sort of technology could really help with that, and equally can help us to map out our network and to plan our networks and towns. So I mentioned smart metering earlier, and we had uh, a launch of this project. And this one, we feel, is really, really fundamental to most of the things that I've spoken about and to help customers to have data to decide what it is that they want to do. And we're doing this project in three phases. So we've started um, with our IT system, and there's a lot of back-end work to be done in the IT system. So for the next um, three to four years, we're going to be focused on that and also rolling out the initial meters to people who are really, really interested, I suppose, in engaging and having a smart metering early on. So we'll have 250,000 meters out on the system within the next four years. And then we'll be moving on to uh, phase two, which is to give 
bigger amounts of uh, flexibility and functionality. So as well as customers getting data, we'll also be able to switch remotely, which will, I suppose, save people from being at home if they and not needing to meet an appointment with us. And the third one then will be around engaging with gas meters where customers, I suppose, want to do that. They do have a gas meter. And also, if they've got local generation, that all of that information would be available to them and would be traded through the smart meter. So um, overall, I suppose we have uh, a lot of technologies, including you know, smart fault indicators, uh, self-healing networks to increase reliability. We've got the smart metering project, which is going to help us with customer flexibility as our controllable generation and a project we have called Servo. In terms of asset visibility, we need an awful lot more information coming back to us so we can make decisions, and that's going to require an awful lot of communications infrastructure, Internet of Things and architectures and radio technology. So overall, the system that we're looking at having in the future is, I suppose, very complicated when you look at it. Um, the job for us is to make sure that we present that as something very simple to customers, and we're certainly looking forward to doing that and playing a really big role in decarbonisation and in helping with our climate change challenge. Is that going to be easy? No, it's not. Is it going to be interesting along the way? I'd say it definitely is in every sense of the word. But is it possible? I suppose we certainly hope so. So thank you very much. There are plans for ESB Networks. Thank you very much, Marguerite. Now, smart networks aim to enable the energy demand side to become increasingly active in creating efficiencies, which can make significant contributions to the decarbonisation of the energy sector. And so we look forward to the insights of our next speaker. Sarah Bell is founder and chief executive of Tempest Energy, an innovative and award-winning energy demand response company. So to talk about the future of demand response, would you please welcome Sarah Bell. Uh, thank you very much. It's lovely to be here today. <clears throat> We've had the privilege of getting to know ESB uh, uh, through the Free Electrons program. Uh, for those of you who are not aware what this program uh, is, uh, it's basically uh, an innovation uh, dating service, I guess. Uh, the utilities have got together, selected 12 different startup companies um, around the world, and then have spent um, a period of time of six months getting to know those companies. Uh, and we've been incredibly impressed with the, uh, the seniority of the people that ESB has sent to this program. It obviously takes up a lot of uh, uh, executive time. Uh, but people do business with people. So unless you get to, uh, to meet the appropriate people, it's very hard for startups to really help utilities uh, uh, to innovate. So uh, uh, it's, it's been great to have that opportunity to get to know ESB. Uh, the former Australian Prime Minister was in London recently um, talking about all the benefits of climate change. As temperatures rise, uh, fewer people will die from the cold. Uh, because, of course, no one dies from heat exhaustion, uh, no one drowns in a flood, right? Uh, I think the, uh, the big challenge with getting involved in the climate science debate uh, is you keep having to deal with lunatics. Whereas if instead you focus on the economics uh, and get on with using technology innovation uh, to clean up the energy system in the lowest cost possible way, then all of that stuff just becomes noise. So that's the approach that we take at Tempus. Our mission is, try to, is to try to change energy systems, both for customers and the environment. Flexible demand, so customers who are prepared to be flexible with when they use electricity, if you match that flexibility to renewables, then you get the lowest cost way of decarbonizing our energy systems. It enables renewables to outcompete. But of course, to outcompete, you need to have a market to compete in. And that's often the challenge uh, in energy markets. If we're trying to get to 100% uh, renewable, a completely clean energy system, uh, then we're going to have a lot of flexibility challenges. Uh, if you look at this chart here, uh, in the gray space, that's basically oversupply of renewables. In a proper market, that should equate to a really low or negative price. 
because the market should be telling customers to use electricity. The orange space should be unbelievably expensive uh, because we don't have enough. We want to signal to customers, uh, don't use unless you have to. So what Tempest actually does is put technology in customer premises to enable them to automatically move to the lower price periods and avoid the high price periods. So renewables become supported by demand flexibility uh, and the customer experiences a lower cost energy. So it's a win-win for the environment, it's a win for, for customers. Put in a different way, moving customers out of peak demand into the lower demand periods. As customers, we know that being flexible pays. Many of us have been using off-peak trains for years. Why do we do it? Because if it's not inconvenient, uh, we, we would like to benefit from a lower ticket. Uh, the electricity system is exactly the same. Um, if we can persuade customers to be flexible and therefore enjoy a lower cost uh, energy bill, uh, then they will be prepared to be flexible. And from a system point of view, we'll have to build fewer networks, like we can build fewer train lines, and pay for fewer generating stations, like we buy fewer trains. So to customers, this actually will make complete sense. Uh, but the challenge is that customers in most markets don't get access to that ability to be flexible because the incentives simply aren't there. Instead of showing, uh, like in the previous slide, the orange space, instead of showing that's unbelievably expensive, what we do is we take that cost and we smear it. By smearing it, we actually lose the innovation opportunity because companies like mine can't make enough money out of flexibility and therefore it doesn't happen. So I guess, uh, and this is the challenge I think in any country, uh, we need courageous politicians who are prepared to stick their neck out. But kind of good luck with that, right? So therefore, uh, as an industry, I think we need to be showing that this is possible, uh, pushing it from a technology point of view, and showing our comfort with being able to use and, and create flexibility so that we can drive that courage. Essentially, what flexible customers do in a proper um, economically rational energy system is they effectively withhold demand and push prices down. Now, it, uh, around the world, we have a range of different markets from uh, at one extreme, places like the Middle East or China, where there isn't really a wholesale market at all, uh, through to the other extreme, uh, uh, which is Australia, where it's the most volatile electricity market in the world. Uh, in most states, there aren't capacity markets, so all the value is actually uh, in the market. So Tempest is currently working in Australia, uh, and the reason why we're so attracted to that market is we want to demonstrate that if you use the economics of supply and demand, uh, you can actually decarbonize at the lowest possible cost. Um, by putting equipment in the customer premises, this is a, an example of a car to just to get everyone's sort of imagination going. Uh, but we, we work mainly in the uh, commercial and industrial space, but there's no reason why this can't be uh, delivered right down to individual customers. Uh, by putting equipment in their premises, and using machine learning to understand their load, we can automatically move it. So we don't need the customer to, to be involved. The customer doesn't need to be an energy trader. Uh, I personally think that many people won't want to be energy traders. And therefore, we have to use technology to make this as simple as possible. So with air conditioning load, for example, you can pre-cool a building and then turn the chiller off when, the when prices are very high. Uh, with electric heating, you can do the same. Obviously, you need to understand the thermal capacity of the building in order to do that. Um, but there's multiple different uh, loads that can be used for flexibility. We ran an electricity supply business in the UK for about 18 months, which was like um, 
an experimental hub for us. Uh, for a, a small tech company to run a utility is very, very challenging. We don't have your sort of uh, balance sheet, uh, but we needed to run this business uh, uh, to be able to show that this is possible. Uh, because we didn't, no, no, no utility was prepared to use our technology because no one had done this before. So we put equipment into various different customers, for example, Hertz. Uh, we were able to significantly reduce their energy cost uh, uh, because they were flexible. In a proper market, and there's now a joke in the, uh, the free electrons program about proper markets because I went on and on about this uh, so much. It's a particular passion of mine. But in a proper market, you can really save a lot of money. Uh, in Australia, uh, up to 60% of the wholesale energy cost. Because in a market that spikes at $14,000 a megawatt hour, customers avoiding those periods uh, uh, obviously make a lot of sense. That's a very, very large saving. Through the electrons program, we've done uh, the free electrons program, I mean, uh, we've done a deal with uh, the largest electricity supplier in Australia. Now, as a tech company, you have to align the commercial interest. No existing utility is going to do a deal for the hell of it. Why would they? Uh, they need to find business models that make sense to them. So Origin owns half the generation they supply to customers. So for the other half, they're completely exposed to electricity market price risk. So if a customer uses electricity at $14,000 a megawatt hour, uh, and Origin has sold them uh, a fixed tariff of, say, 30 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, that's an unbelievably loss-making customer. So by us helping that customer move away from those periods, Origin creates a more profitable customer, uh, and the customer can get a lower bill and the environment uh, uh, is, uh, is bettered. So finding those commercial win-wins is incredibly important. So what we do is we use machine learning to price predict. We're not a, an electricity trader. We're not predicting forward prices. What we're predicting is what the closing electricity market price is going to be for a given period in real time. So to do that, you need to predict demand because you need to know where demand is going to cross supply because that's obviously the price point. So we predict that price very accurately and we then rank the, uh, the periods. So the absolute price prediction is actually not as important as the ranking. You need to know uh, which is going to be the most expensive uh, period and when is going to be the least expensive period. So we use machine learning to do that price prediction. Uh, and on top of that, because we have understood the capability of the customer to be flexible, we're basically combining that understanding of flexibility, thinking about um, a customer's flexibility like a commodity, a little bit like, say, uh, coffee beans. Now, we want to sell the coffee beans uh, before they go off. We don't want to sell them too early and we want to make sure we maximize uh, the value from them. We think about customers' demand flexibility in the same way, um, and we're effectively trading it to, the, to, to make as much money out of it as possible. Uh, and that's why this is such a, a profitable way of approaching it. Um, so you can see in the, the bottom red chart, we've become very accurate at uh, predicting the price. Even though this is a very... Uh, spiky market. A lot, of, um, a lot of organizations who are less keen to change are reluctant to accept that customers will be prepared to be flexible. Uh, but I believe very strongly that the combination of convenience, using technology to actually make this easier for customers, with the right commercial incentives, can drive this market. But that's why it's so important to get the right uh, incentives. I am frequently astounded by uh, the attitudes to customers from various different uh, organizations, obviously not ESB. Uh, recently, uh, the Competition and Markets Authority did an investigation into the energy market in the UK. Uh, and their, their findings were quite interesting. Uh, and I paraphrase. 
Uh, customers are stupid and lazy and need to get off their fat asses and switch supplier. Customers are not stupid or lazy. They are busy. We all lead very, very busy lives. That's why it's so incredibly important for technology to help customers to make this, uh, this easy and convenient um, and for the right commercial incentives to be there. We're in a very different world now as an energy industry. We need to make customers love these propositions. But to do that, we need to actually earn that love. And I think that's the challenge for, for all of us in the room today. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Sarah, and all of our speakers in this first session. It's going to bring us to our first panel questions and answer session. Uh, they're going to answer questions that you have posted versus via Slido, as well as the questions that I am going to ask. You can still submit a question by navigating to Slido on your mobile phone browser, entering the event code Take Charge, and you proceed by picking, and then we go on and we'll take these picture, uh, questions from Slido. I have a couple of questions I want to put to the audience just for a show of hands. Uh, and this, I'm not trying to pick on accountants here. Do we have any accountants in the room? Just a matter of interest. Anyone show of hands accountants? Just one down there. Two. Okay. Now, the reason I ask is uh, accountants, I think, in businesses are known for keeping a very tight management on the costs, always looking to reduce bills, try and make sure they spend as little as possible of their company's money. How many people here reckon that when it comes to the management of their own household finances, that they're as diligent as the accountants and the companies in which they work are? How many people can honestly say that they are? <laughs> Nobody is putting their hand up. Okay, uh, did, that doesn't surprise me. How many people here would think that they actively manage their own domestic electricity bills? That's a relatively small number for everybody who's here who think they actively manage it. And when it comes to actively manage amongst those people, how many do it by investing in the newest technology to let the technology do the work for you? Again, small number put in their hands up. How many people just actively do it by deciding to go around switching the lights off or turning off the hot water and all the rest of it or telling other family members to do so? Ah. That's where everybody is putting up their hands. Oliver, how does that strike you? Because it seems to be it's the old fashioned way of dealing with switch off the lights, turn off the hot water, rather than investing in new technology to help reduce the bills. Well, it's, the easiest way of, it's the easiest way of doing it. And, and, and um, having some new infrastructure or purchasing something involves quite a lot of decision making and action uh, and forethought. It's much easier to manage uh, energy consumption in the moment. Okay, so how much of it then comes down to as well just persuading people to see the difference between what their bill is and what they're paying and what it could be if they were to actively manage their energy consumption? Yeah, yeah the rematerialization is a really interesting point and I focus on it a little bit when, when I was talking earlier. But the, the, the fracture between uh, what you're doing in the moment and what that means, uh, the, the more that's decoupled, the harder it is to, to understand what you're actually doing and what, what the consequences of that are. The, the supermarket example was a very good one. Smart metering take-up is something that I want to bring up with you, Marguerite, because you mentioned targets and whatever. But again, how much of it is that ESB is just going to actually have to almost push smart metering on people, almost present it to them, here you are, this is what you must have, rather than waiting for the consumer to come along and ask to have it? Yeah, I suppose it's very much a mix. I mean, we're certainly going to be in the area of customers needing and wanting to opt in to smart metering, um, which actually, I suppose, is part of a European directive, to be honest, anyway, that you have to opt in. But it might actually work in our favor because, uh, and maybe Oliver has a view on this, but from the point of view of psychology, if you feel something has been forced on you, you're probably much might, less likely to get engaged uh, with it. But uh, the yeah. fact that if people see benefits, if we get to a situation and we have something like the orb that you mentioned yeah. earlier that shows yeah. when prices are high, mm -hmm. when they're low, and if people can see information like that, if it's convenient for them, if it helps them save money, then we might get a higher, much higher level of engagement, particularly if people feel that they have an option to, to say that that's what I'd like yeah. rather than I have to have. 
your instinct about pushing a choice on people is correct, and it's really bad. It's 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 uh, it's very disabling, and it and it, it, it you know, it's, it's it, even if you came to that conclusion separately, you wouldn't want to be pushed into that. But it's very it's actually very easy to do. The, the uptake of smart meters is very easy to do, um, and uh, it simply need to use something called the injunctive norm, which is quite easy. So the, okay, the, explain the, that to us. I will. So the descriptive and injunctive norm are quite different. The descriptive norm tells us that that's behavior commonly performed. We talked a little bit about that. Um, a good example of that is that most people will break the speed limit. That's behavior commonly performed. The injunctive norm is behavior commonly approved. They can be different. And most people will say that um, speeding is bad. Don't speed because you, know, you might harm me. So you can see a decoupling between the descriptive and the injunctive norm. A very good example of this was a lovely little experiment in America on water um, tap inserts and uh, uh, stuff for the lavatory flushing thing. It doesn't matter what they were necessarily. Went, uh, um, went down one street, knocked on the door, and said, we're from the federal government, and we have some tap inserts. They're free. Would you like them? Uh, very low uptake of that. It was strange. It was out of the blue. It was unscheduled. Why would I have something for free? It's very suspicious. There's lots of challenges with that. They went down the second street, uh, simply asked people, do you think that water conservation is a good idea? You could simply replace energy conservation. Water conservation is a good idea. Most people will say yes to that. It's a, there was no demand other than just do you think it's a good idea. They went down the third street, knocked on the doors and said, hello, we're from the federal government. Most people in this area think water <coughs> conservation is a good idea. Would you like some free tap inserts? The majority of people will take them. That's an example of the injunctive norm in that area. You could say the provincial norm as well. People in this area think that water conservation is a good idea. People in this area think that smart meters are a good idea. You can simply synthesize that or, or, <coughs> or, or, or generate it by asking the people in the area to whom you need to deliver smart meters a very simple, open-ended, uh, uh, non, uh, less specific question. Do you think that it would be a good idea if you could see how much energy you were using and how much it was costing you? Most people will say yes. Then you use that. 85% of people in da -da -da, postcode think that being able to see how much you use is a good idea. Come and get your reply for your free uh, um, uh, smart meter. Done. That's it. OK, some of the questions that are coming very slide I'm going to put this to Sarah and Marguerite. How can we ensure that the new tariff structures enabled by smart meters don't become so complex that they make it harder for consumers to understand their use? This is very interesting because when you take things like mobile phones, for example, people are completely confused by the packages available to them and don't know which one to pick. Sarah. Uh, yes, I, mean, I think the tariff st structures don't have to be complicated. When we ran our supply business in the UK, we still gave customers a flat tariff on the basis that if they're prepared to be flexible, then they deserve to benefit. So it was actually very, very straightforward. Um, I think if you put too much complexity uh, into it, uh, it's very off-putting uh, for customers. Marguerite, your view on that? Yeah, I suppose from a regulatory perspective, I have to stay miles away from tariffs, but just as a customer, just uh, I, I think... Uh, it is ripe for that level of confusion and complexity. Actually, I'd say we're seeing some of that already. So I'm really a big fan of, you know, something really simple, price high, price low. Now is a good time to use it. Now isn't, and I think a lot of customers are in the same space because of your busy customers. Uh, but but it is a potential risk. And could I just because we and it's not a it's not a simple gradient line from more complex to to less complex. There's a real drop off if you make it simple. And simple doesn't doesn't just mean that you're losing out in presenting information. We have something called satisficing, and we tend we tend to um, when things get really complex, we put a floor on our expectations rather than a ceiling on our expectations. So instead of going for the best, we try to minimise it and go make sure we don't get the worst. The same reason why. We'll have McDonald's when we're abroad and we need something to eat very quickly. It's not because it's the best meal we can get, but we know that it's not going to be the worst either. Um, <laughs> that resonates very well with the audience. Good. Um, but, but, but also things that when you look at a phone tariff, we'll go with price rather than all of the indications. We'll go with brand because why not? That's another way of doing it. Mm -hmm. These aren't choices that are, these are, I don't make a choice based on brand or price because I want to make a choice based on brand or choice. I make a choice based on brand or price because it's too complicated to make a decision in any other way. So the reduction of simplicity is very important in terms of uh, uh, engaging uptake for people. Marguerite mentioned decarbonisation, and the question that strikes me, Oliver, on the basis of what she was saying, do people actually think that their behaviour 
influences the weather outcomes in the sense that it strikes me that a lot of people say it's always somebody else, that here in Ireland, well, industry says it's farmers who are creating the carbon. Yeah. Uh, individuals say it's industry and farmers. Ireland in general says, well, we're only a small country. Mm -hmm. It's China is doing it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ariely says it very well. He says if you wanted to invent a problem that was the most psychologically different to deal with, you'd have come up with uh, climate change. It's, it's distal in all dimensions. It's not here, it's not me, it's not now, and it's not clear. It's very, very difficult to deal with that thing. Um, same thing with earthquake. No, no one buys earthquake. People that haven't bought earthquake insurance before the earthquake all of a sudden buy it on the day of the earthquake just because it suddenly becomes very proximal, hear me now and clear. So those are problems, yes. Uh, uh, to deal with it is not to just try to convince people that that's not the case because that is the thing that they think is the, is the case. It's to turn it much more provincial. To tell people how other people behave is the way to do it. The solution to that problem is to avoid it, basically. Yeah, because the question has come in from another person in the audience, yeah. which is more important, individual behaviour change or societal change? It's a really good question. Um, there's a big feedback loop between the two. Uh, um, really individual, because uh, individual behaviour, uh, uh, because societal behaviour is uh, an aggregate of individuals' behaviour. Um, but some of the examples we've been talking about today are using society's behaviour or perceptions of behaviour as a feedback loop to change individual behaviour. But the, uh, the, the bold question to the answer, which is, which is more important, individual behaviour change or societal change, is individual change. And it's quite simple to do, and it's quite simple to do on, on mass, and then you will see a, a change in society. That's, that's a, a link to yourself. Nice come in there. I think the, the, the opportunity to make it real uh, is definitely there in things like air quality. Uh, many organisations who are striving to, uh, to help climate change uh, have had no su success in focusing on actually deaths from poor air quality, uh, how to clean up the air, etc., etc. It's something that we as humans can actually relate to. Climate change is so far away uh, from our reality, it's very hard to engage in it, but it is possible to make it uh, much, much closer but also to make the process of getting involved more exciting and interesting. Well, it's linked to that as another question that's up on the screen. Is behavioural change in the electricity sector more difficult to bring about than in other sectors? So, Sarah and Marguerite, your views on that. Sarah first. I think, uh, well, I'm, I'm not an expert in behaviour change, I think, uh, uh, but I don't think it's any harder in the electricity system than anywhere else in terms of behavioural change. What is hard in the energy sector uh, is where the incentives sit. It's much harder as a company to come up with a really compelling proposition uh, to a customer if you can't access the value from the system. Marguerite? I think to some extent it's because we're trying to change something that people have always used in a particular way and now trying to ask them to change their behaviours. You're right, there's a level of disassociation between people's behaviours within their home and choices they might make in the, in the longer uh, term. So up front to try and get engagement around uh, e-heat and heat transport, we can see at the moment in terms of EVs in the country, there's quite a slow take up. So uh, there are other factors that people will take into account. So I think you have to present it as something that you will do if all other factors are equal, maybe might be the case. So there's a price challenge with EVs, for example. So uh, I think people would choose EVs if they felt that the price was, was a little bit more comparable to, to diesel. So there's other factors that have to come into play. I think a big untapped, well, it's maybe not untapped. We're, we're certainly making some efforts there as to, um, it's back into that area of the 60% dependence I was talking about earlier on. So particularly children, um, they, they can form a really, really important conscience within homes um, once you educate them in schools about the impact of climate change. So that idea of whole pester power, that's hugely powerful. Um, so uh, we're starting to work in schools, but I think a lot, there, there, there's an awful lot could be done with children in schools that would have an impact within households, maybe more so than engaging with the adults. Okay, linked to that, and I think all of you can maybe have an opinion on this, a question there from Claire, whose responsibility is it to, and I like the use of the words, push and cajole and encourage changes in consumer behaviour? Is it politicians and policy makers? Is it industry? Is it green NGOs? Oliver. So there's an interesting implication in the question, which is the responsibility to push and cajole and encourage. So let's remember there are two ways to push and cajole and encourage, um, explicitly and implicitly, or overtly and covertly. Some of the things that we were talking about earlier um, 
uh, mean that we can change behaviour without people necessarily knowing. And in fact, their behaviour is informed without them necessarily knowing. This is actually a benefit that the uh, electricity sector has. Um, there are covert and over um, um, uh, uh, mechanisms at play with energy consumption. So let's assume that it's either pushing and controlling and encouraging change unknowingly or knowingly. Um, who, to whose, whose responsibility is that for? Well, because we discount the future so massively as individuals, uh, eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die, burn the hand is worth two in the bush, we discount the future hugely, of course we do, we've lived 100,000 years uh, with the possibility of death within weeks. Um, the future is a foreign place and a place that we don't consider very much as individuals. Therefore, we need, we need a body to deal with that behaviour in a lot of ways. So uh, policy makers, for sure, uh, perhaps industry, although the incentives are slightly in the wrong place, uh, but poli uh, policy makers, yeah. Okay, I'll put this one to you, Sarah. Does the behaviour of energy sector leaders need to change first before consumer behaviour can change? Um, I think this is, uh, this is always a challenging one. Uh, uh, there, are, there is a big incumbency problem uh, uh, in the energy sector. Uh, there are multiple companies out there who are benefiting uh, from climate change. So it's very hard to convince them uh, to change. Uh, the reason why it's so important to encourage the forward thinking utilities and encourage their leaders uh, and to help them make money out of this uh, is because that starts a very, very positive push which other organizations then can't ignore. It's been incredibly interesting uh, to see how GE and Siemens uh, are being reported uh, in the news recently. Uh, so uh, GE has lost about 30% of their share price. Uh, Siemens has gained about 12%. Uh, and Siemens is widely regarded as having pushed much harder uh, in the, uh, uh, the smarter renewable uh, space. Uh, they're being punished by the market. Uh, or, or rather they're being rewarded by the market, GE is being punished by the market, uh, and that helps to encourage leaders to, to push that, uh, that direction. Okay, and this is for you, Marguerite. You look around the world, I presume, to compare yourself to what is happening in other countries. So what other countries are pioneering smart grid rollout, and how do you think, well, if not just how Ireland can learn from those, how well do you think you're comparing? We're genuinely uh, right up there with the best of them. We get as many people making inquiries of us, particularly around the renewable space, because that level of penetration of renewables, particularly on quite rural networks, is something that hasn't been experienced in an awful lot of other countries yet. Things like self-healing networks and some of the solutions we have in the renewable space, other people are really keen to learn from us. We're one of the first people to have the kind of uh, level of penetration of renewables and downline switches and things like that that we have as well in our medium voltage network. At the same time, there's certainly nobody has the, you know, the, the, the full gamut, so there's, there's certainly things we can learn from other places. So uh, one that we have a bit of learning to do, I think, is in the area of battery storage. Um, and uh, you know, there, there are certainly trials in New York, places like that, that we can learn from. And particularly, I think, uh, both Australia and Germany in the context of solar power and some of the things that they did with tariffs, which um, they wouldn't do again, given another chance. That has caused, I suppose, a lot of um, take up of the technology, but at great cost. So there's, there's things we can certainly learn from other countries, but equally we've had many inquiries from people coming to visit us and find out what we're doing. So um, modesty forbids at one level, but we are right up there with, with the best of them. Now there's a question coming from Oliver, how could you persuade more people to switch to electric vehicles? But before you answer that, I know from radio program I present here, The Last Word in Today FM, we get lots of people interested in electric vehicles, but they seem to have three major things that they have issues with. One is the range for which the car can actually go before it needs to be recharged. The second is the availability of recharging and the time it takes to recharge the car. But the biggest issue particularly is the price and the resale value. So what would your solution be to encourage people to switch to EVs? So um, of the three things you mentioned, price and, price and resale value, yes. um, that's not really, that's true that they think that's the case, but it's not really the case. Otherwise, we wouldn't sell Aston Martins and Porsches and things like that. So, so price is not really a challenge. Um, the uh, range anxiety and, and uh, 
places where you can re uh, recharge, th this is a real challenge, actually. Uh, and we, we overvalue loss twice as much as the pleasure of gain of equal size. So loss is a real challenge for us. Or the downsides are a real challenge for us. What's also worse about that is that we're doing that as a frame. The only other frame is a uh, petrol or uh, diesel engines, of course, and they've been around for 100 years, and they're quite good at the moment. I mean, there was terrific an uh, range anxiety in 1896 when the first car was advertised. It was called Dispense with a Horse. I mean, it would, it would go two, mi two miles an hour and, 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 and break down very frequently, and you'd have to have a man walking in front of you and a handle to crank it. So if you think about, um, yeah, so, 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 so it... it, it it's a terrific challenge. The range anxiety needs to be dealt with. It's being dealt with at the moment. Elon Musk just recently, they, they, they have a 600 mile range car that they're just bringing out. Well, that brings me to the other issue that comes up. No. People are afraid of being early movers, that if yeah. they buy the first type of electric yeah. vehicle, yeah. very quickly yeah. a new type will yeah. come along, yeah. which is much better yeah. and makes their one that they've spent a lot of money on redundant. Yeah, that's okay though, because they've already bought it and that's fine, right? <laughs> That's okay, and some people like to be the early the early adopters anyway. That, that that's kind of okay. That that's not so much of a challenge. But there's something really interesting that you've raised here, which which is that, which is that um, in terms of understanding people's behaviour and understanding the uh, motivation and how to motivate people's behaviour, there is only so far we can go. There there is a prime there is a primary condition above the behavioural condition, which is which is that. Uh, uh, is it actually doable in the first place? So for instance, I, could, I can convince someone to stay in their room, or I can convince someone to leave their room, I can increase motivation to leave their room, but I can't increase motivation to leave someone's room if they're in prison, if it's physically impossible. There's a, there is a challenge with EVs around, around range anxiety and around recharging, and I can only do so much to kind of affect that at the moment. Those things are real, they loom large, there's no magic tricks around that. Uh, it is changing, it will change the uptake will be quite large when, when we see it. So there's, there's not a magic answer to that, I'm afraid. Okay, I'm going to come to the end of this session with a very good question, which I think only Marguerite, you're in a position to answer because I think our visitors from outside Ireland will probably be baffled by this particular question. But how do we encourage consumers to engage with smart metering, particularly when we consider the furore over water metering over the last few years? <laughs> yeah, I think there could be multiple PhDs in that one, but I think it's back to that idea of the benefit and the choice. And if you can see benefits, particularly with your neighbours, uh, it's not very complicated. You get a benefit out of it, and it's not enforced or it's not forced on people, then uh, hopefully people will engage with it. And we certainly see huge benefits in the distribution system. If people would give us access to that data, uh, it would reduce costs overall because we'd be able to run a much tighter system. Um, but there, there's a challenge in it, um, particularly because of that engagement, but hopefully because we've always had electricity meters, we won't end up there. Okay, Sarah Bell, Marguerite Sayers, and Oliver Payne, thank you all very much for being with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Now, everybody, this concludes our first session of the conference, leads us into a coffee break. Please have a look at all the exhibits around the hall, including the Smart Networks display. Uh, over the break, we're inviting you to take part in another slide all poll. So what's the most important for you in the low carbon future? Is it A, to save the planet, B, to save money, C, as little disruption to my routine as possible, D, no complicated technology, or E, cutting edge digital solutions? Please be back by half past 11 in your seats for the next session. Thank you very much.